Ottomans do not strike us as collectors at any time in any place. No cabinets of curiosities, wonder rooms, or treasuries have been located apart from those at the imperial palace. Collecting, however, is an unruly passion, uh, and naturally Ottoman men and women were not immune to the thrills of hunting, which is often described as a malady. While psychologists often highlight the controlling and impulsive dark side of to collecting, research on early modern collections has grown enormously uh, in recent years and become relevant for material culture studies. The reconstruction of the various ways in which natural specimens or antiques and art or trivia uh, collected, displayed, and given an order, and not necessarily a taxonomic order, provides us with valuable insights into the nature of both objects of the past and the individuals who collected them. Unfortunately, the documentation and study of the pre-19th century Ottoman material culture is limited basically to probate inventories, terekes or muhallefats, and a few other kinds of lists and registers, and these documents suffer from a number of limitations. What I'm going to present this evening is an unusual inventory, uh, which I explore as part of a book project that I have been recently working on, tentatively entitled an Ottoman gentleman born before his time. Uh, and here I discuss the issues of collecting and antiquarianism in the making of an Ottoman Celebi, who was probably an astrologer astronomer, possibly uh, a calligrapher who excelled calligraphic and artistic decoupage as well, known as katı, uh, katı. Uh, definitely, he was an artist, whom art and antiques collector, a poet, a bibliophile, and a gourmet. Uh, a pioneering study on Ottoman material culture, entitled The House of an Ottoman Provincial Turkish Efendi in the 16th century, dated 1960, introduced Ali Celebi's probate inventory drawn up over four days from 15 to 18 January 1588, which identifies him as a fee-folding landlord, a Zaim in Buda, today's Budapest, who died perhaps earlier that month. Lakos Fekete, a renowned Hungarian Ottomanist, with references to several Ali Celebis of Buda that he encountered in various documents of the period, suggested that he was originally an imperial accountant, resident of Buda from 1569, if not earlier. He also argued that Ali's honorific title, Celebi, no longer reserved for the descendants of the royal house, a tradition believed to have started with the sons of Bezid I, had already become commonplace in distinguishing the Ottoman gentleman. So we have a gentleman here, Ali Celebi. Fekete very brilliantly chose to give a hypothetical tour of Ali Celebi's house by rendering nearly 600 items, and this is really what I mean by unusual, uh, listed uh, in the inventory. Hence, he sheds light on Ali Celebi's daily rituals and the domestic culture's new access to a superfluity of material possessions. This document, compiled in a codex, a compilation of completely uh, unrelated records, including land registers generally from the 16th century, is now in Vienna, National Bibliothek, together with a few other probate inventories. Although sizable by 16th century Ottoman standards, 
The other inventories from the same codex that I have studied uh, from 1558 uh, to 1588 are still strikingly modest in comparison to that of uh, Ali Celebe. On the other hand, although it is vast and rich, the inventory of Ali Celebi's house at his death seems to be incomplete. Some pages are missing from the end, and there is also the possibility that the entire documentation of 16 January was later removed from record. As a working hypothesis, I suggest that the missing parts included those possessions of Ali Celebi's household, which were later returned to his wife or wives and children. Uh, I mean, since we don't have any record of linen, uh, cushions, pillows, etc., uh, this and these were usually parts of a bride's trousseau. Uh, I uh, this is only a suggestion, but I think that uh, the reason why we don't have a listing of such household domestic items in this inventory is because they were later returned to his family. In the surviving 16 pages, uh, while some items are described in detail, uh, given, for example, the kind, uh, color, uh, even, for example, in the case of textiles, even the pattern and the, the buttons, claps, or the lining of garments, some other entries simply name the object and notice quantity. The entire inventory was recorded by the same hand, same scribe. It was written very, very poorly, perhaps in haste, uh, and could also be a, a draft. The inventory starts with listing, of, uh, listing the contents of a basket. These were all ceremonial items expected to be found in the possession of a high-ranking military bureaucrat. Uh, not the middle rank fee folder that the document points to. Uh, namely, three helmets, uh, two of which were plain and had a kawuk, and one of them was gilded. Uh, a colored muslin kerchief to be wrapped perhaps around the gilded helmet, horse trappings, a mace, and two pairs of overshoes, and three pairs of spurs. The second entry listed a few items in a chest, ranging from two sets of uh, knives to a colorful animal tail, perhaps a horse tail. Prayer rugs, embroidered napkins and spreads, which altogether looked like objects that a military <coughs> bureaucrat would be accompanied with during a military campaign. Thirdly, the contents of a wrap, a bohja, all textile indicated as new was listed. The inventory continues with a wealth of objects contained mostly in cupboards, baskets, trunks, chests, coffers, cardboard boxes, wraps, uh, pouches, and kerchiefs of various kinds and sizes, sometimes one put inside the other, with no mention of their location in the house. There's also a wealth of jars, bottles, and cups of glass, ceramic, and china. From bulky pieces of arms and armor, to buttons or tiny pieces of exotic aromatic woods and roots, all that he amassed seems to have been neatly placed in a container of some sort, equally artistically and luxuriously made, and carefully classified, perhaps even cataloged. At times, as was the case with his three horses, some items appear to be listed totally out of the context, out of context or order, 
Still, as in cabinets of curiosities, there was order out of order in Ali Celebi's collection of daily things and rarities, arts and antiquities, various paraphernalia, and more than a hundred manuscripts. This is, again, something very, very unusual. Such cabinets were created in early modern Europe as a result of a growing desire to place the collector, the prince, or the scholar in a wider world. In the privacy of his home, the collector of wonders could study the nature and the divine for the sheer gratification of knowledge without any immediate agenda. This desire developed during the 14th century and continued into the 17th, leading into an age of the encyclopedist and the enlightenment. In the Ottoman realm, Collecting, uh, the display of collections, and discursive practices and civilized manners that embodied it do not seem to appear as a prerequisite for the negotiation of social standing until the 19th century. However, wealth and scope of Ali Celebi's possessions suggest that we might have been quite wrong uh, at least hasty in reaching this conclusion. I will be presenting here just a small part of the inventory and introduce only some of the objects relating to first hygiene, style, and elegance of the person in question, secondly, contents of his cellar, and thirdly, his artwork, antiques and exotica, and unfortunately, I would be omitting uh, many, for example, his uh, manuscript library uh, and some other markers of uh, identity. So, I, among Ali Celebi's most intimate domestic possessions were numerous pieces of bathing paraphernalia, towels, washcloths, and wrappers, including those of embroidered fine linen. The accoutrements for combing and trimming his hair or beard, exfoliating bath clothes, uh, kese, uh, back stretching tools, portrays him as an elegant man. He was a Celebi indeed, an Ottoman gentleman, if not a dandy. Ali was able to afford items of physical comfort and personal hygiene and had amassed a wealth of luxury goods solely used for beautification. He had razors and razor sharpeners, all imports from Iran, to rid himself of unwanted bodily hair. And for example, five dozens of musk scented uh, soaps imported from Saxony. Like his hair combs and stretch bags made of ebony, his collection of perfumed waters and oils kept in glass bottles, a big chunk of musk and its marble mill, and some amount of coal to darken his eyebrows and eyelashes were all imports from Far East. Henna, perhaps to dye his beard, came from China. High wedged bath clocks, uh, not described here in detail, were also often made of fine exotic woods and decorated with precious mother of pearl, ivory, coral, and silver, all rare and valuable. The two glass mirrors, one with a gilded frame, were probably Venetian. He must have carried all of this in a bundle to the nearby hammam in Buddha, as it was very rare to have an indoor bath chamber at home, even in Istanbul uh, in those days. Ali was keen on dressing. His clothing and trappings did not only serve as a marker of his class, but also of his person. His shirts, underpants, trousers, robes, shawls, cloaks, made out of various fabrics and mostly kept in 
separate embroidered bundles point to several changing, making basic hygiene possible. Many were made out of uh, made of imported or scarce fabrics. His headgears were plenty. He had more than a dozen of kabuks, including two mujevezes, uh, a tall formal ceremonial headdress made of many braided and padded folds, and worn by high-ranking officials only. These were keenly stored in boxes. Five measures of the finest quality of turban muslin, destar, and several other new and or used wraps and covers imported from faraway places such as Kandahar in today's Afghanistan displayed you know, considerable pomp. His footwear included multiple pairs of decorated slippers, inner shoes, <coughs> shoes, overshoes, and riding boots made out of red or yellow fine leather. The four pairs of spurs, one of which was gold-plated, all seemed to be uh, local products. His robes and overcoats, namely two dozens of woolen or satin cloaks lined either with brocade and taffeta or sable, rabbit, marten furs to protect him from damp and cold, were noted primarily as red. The costly Venetian scarlatos, a shiny woolen uh, preferred mostly for its crimson, are not worthy. Its lilac and green varieties were also stocked by Ali in shocking numbers. He had a number of raincoats, cloaks, short overcoats, and capes, mostly made of woolens or belts, but just one single black fur made from the belly of an animal, which was not specified. His garments, like the personal effects of other military bureaucrats, shows ostentatious use of colors and patterns perhaps, not seen in the clothing of the modest members of the society and communicated the status of the Sultan's representatives. Somber clothing was restricted to the impoverished and the scholarly. Among his overcoats were some special imports uh, called Dolamay Rumeli Kebeyi Erdel and a robe called Menzelavi after an Egyptian sheikh, uh, Sayyid Muhammad Al Menzelavi, and a variety indicated as made of textiles from India, including expensive velvets and silks. Some of these were decorated with silver clasps or fastened with uh, buttons made out of fish bones. In this context, fish bone or fish teeth referred to walrus tusks or more precious ivory of narwhal. There were various other buttons, gold and studded with gems, which were kept separately. Bundles stored in chests contained his many waist belts, sashes and kerchiefs, and really many <coughs> shocking numbers, made of an assortment of fine fabrics, mostly Indian imports. His collection of walking sticks, certainly made out of exotic woods and silver, might have added something to his looks. However, known for their elegance, craftsmanship, history, and variety, walking sticks were often among the collector's items. Ali Celebi had a set of three silver sticks kept in a special boxwood case and one with a mother of pearl handle. Now, the contents of his cellar, which was rarely inventoried postmortem in uh, late 16th century, also indicated his cultivated taste and ability to buy precious, rare, and exotic commodities. 
In addition to 150 dirham kafel, which is a wood of, uh, of a balsam tree from India, which was used for smoking food items, there were various seeds and spices from rare plants and a wealth of uh, medicinal paste and comforts. A manuscript on pharmaceutical recipes in his library and several delicate scales such as his personal interest and knowledge in such preparations. Among the delicacies were jars of quince, watermelon and pumpkin gems and more than a dozen of different kinds of wine, of honey, violet, rose, water lily, pomegranates, cranberry, lemon, sour cherry, and dry grapes, ginger, and pepper. Some of these containers, uh, more than four dozens of cocas and cabanos, uh, specified as glass, porcelain, or ceramic, should also be rare, artistic, and valuable. One jar of queen jam was um, made of copper. There was water from Mecca, which was used to clean you know, some items, including his combs, uh, toothpicks, and prayer beads made out of uh, precious uh, wood, like ebony. And Albany Sun, uh, rainwater collected in April only, which was believed to be therapeutical. Most interestingly, he had eight loaves of sugar, an extreme luxury uh, called Sukkere Bayram, imported either from Egypt or uh, Cyprus in those days. And these were kept in a chest carved out of or decorated with a kind of hardwood uh, called Yusur. Uh, could also be uh, some kind of coral. Um, other sweeteners like honey and uh, grape syrup or molasses and some amount of coffee said to have arrived in Buddha only a decade ago in 1579 were kept in <coughs> fine containers. There was a glass bottle of olive oil. Ali's tableware included both Iznik ware and Chinese porcelain trays, large and deep dishes, smaller bowls and lids, jars and jugs of various sizes, but no plates other than a few copper ones. Uh, there were many coffee cups, Iznik ceramics and Chinese porcelain, included one noted as a red on white uh, with a holder. Wooden spoons, two dozens of knives, possibly European knives, and the wooden Hungarian salt cellar, too, suggest a refined table culture. There were only a few cooking utensils, like copper pots and uh, pans were listed, suggesting that all the kitchen equipment was listed on the missing pages, and uh, or else passed on to his wife or uh, wives. And what we have at our disposal is only a glimpse of what he collected as delicacies and uh, luxuries. Was he a loner? I'm not sure at the moment, but there is no record of a family member. And he surely lived in a world of his own. He must have had his own spaces in his house, rooms for display and storage, and rooms where he practiced his arts and experimented with some recipes. I believe he had a cabinet of curiosities, and he must have reserved a special room or a closet for his 120 plus volumes of manuscripts. In contrast to the imports of various kinds that I have mentioned so far, uh, and much more, such as textiles, glass, ceramics in China, some mundane domestic objects in Ali Celebi's inventory fall into the category of exotica, 
coming from really far away places. Western Africa, Madagascar, India, Himalayas, South Asian seas, and Indonesia, and thereby evoking wonder and awe. In this group of naturalia or mirabilia, especially noteworthy are the 15 stuffed seagulls, a fish gizzard, and a kitsikan listed together. The ancient methods of preventing decay of animal parts with spices, salts, and fragrant substances were later used by poketaries who had knowledge of secret herbal uh, formula and access to all variety of spices and preservatives as well as the curious creatures worthy of preservation that merchants were returning with from distant lands. References to Ottoman taxidermy practices or collecting taxidermy items is rare, very rare. Indeed, the only other case that I was able to locate comes from the mid 18th century daily journal of Sultan Mahmud I, which records that the Sultan enjoyed a crocodile and an unspecified kind of fish stuffed with hashish, uh, which were presented to him as gifts. It's possible that Ali Celebi's interest in taxidermy was related to his interest in astrology, Nuju, a science contained within the field of astronomy. Animal skins and examples of taxidermy were often consulted by medieval European astrologers, but this was not a known practice among the Muslims. And if he had arrived in Buddha, as an elderly man, not knowing any European languages, as I suspect, his chances for interaction with local astrologers or consultation with related manuscripts in Buddha or elsewhere in the Balkans and beyond would have been rather slim. In Ali Celebi's inventory, however, listed together with these animal parts were an astrologue a quadrant and a compass, a book of astronomical observation, two other manuscripts on astrology, a book of omens, certainly a book on fortune telling by reading stars, and with another book on astrology, fortune telling or dream interpretation. Uh, his, I mean, the other titles in his library helped to reinforce uh, his, uh, I mean, my interpretation uh, about him being trained as a mathematician and um, uh, an astronomer. In Ali Celebi's inventory, listed together with these, uh, sorry, uh, this um, uh, manuscripts, uh, are a collection of uh, prayer beads, um, most remarkable of which was a Tesbihi Kalember, called after an island uh, in the Indian Ocean. It was quite, uh, quite valuable, but still ordinary. What is striking is the numerous boxes and chests uh, where he kept his writing equipment all made out of exotic woods, uh, such as ebony, uh, native to southern India, western Africa, Madagascar, and Indonesia, and cedar from North Africa, Eastern Mediterranean, or West Himalayas. The boxes and chests, uh, some of the boxes and chests, were identified as Yusrukari, uh, as I mentioned earlier, either a hard black wood or root, or black corals found usually in deep waters of the tropics or in shallow waters uh, such uh, as uh, New Zealand are noteworthy. 
On the other hand, among piles of various kinds of papers that Ali collected were those from India again, both white and uh, colored, and some amount of the best quality paper, Devlet Abadi, and the amounts, of, uh, the, the amounts these papers certainly exceeded any scribe's or accountant's needs. His writing equipment, no matter how artistic the pieces were, however, was limited in number. It's curious, therefore, that he had a compass, a few delicate scales and weights and other stuff, and it seems that he had busied himself with preparing paper for calligraphy or illumination. Take, for example, the four bundles of gold leaves, which is quite un unexpected from a landlord, a zayim, or an accountant uh, to store. Uh, he could have been a, a basale artist, uh, one who artistically compiled flat colored or marble papers in order to make uh, album leaves. Considering the variety and number of quality papers he possessed, it's quite likely. Or he could have been a decoupage uh, artist, because he had collected a number of kaatı uh, himself. He had uh, one specified as a bahçe fursi, a Persian garden scene. Um, the artist also happens to be an antiquarian. It's natural that Ali Celebi could have come to possess some Hungarian and Austrian arms and armors uh, that he might have inherited or appropriated as trophy, trophy or booty or purchased at the market. However, his uh, Magyar and Nemce weaponry and horse trappings encrusted with precious and semi-precious stones are too many. Something not expected from a Tumariot or a man of letters or an artist to possess, and it's therefore very confusing. It seems that he had also amassed Ottoman arms and armor and horse trappings. Suleiman first soldiers took along with them naturally silk banners, steel war masks, uh, mail, jewel encrusted horse armors, daggers and sheets, and these must have been readily available in Buddha uh, at that time. Not only their sheer numbers and the numerous uh, cases and sheets, boxes and chests where he carefully stored these items, but also the fact that he possessed some unusual items, such as the three dyed horse tails, a viserial insignia is quite intriguing. In the case of firearms, decorative appearance was almost as important as technical excellence. It's confirmed by Ali Celebi's arms and armor, which were inlaid with gold, ivory, corals, mother of pearls, pearls, and other kinds of gems. Uh, these were again, all imported from the East. It should so be noted that the scribe who recorded these items, more than 600 uh, items, was familiar with the precious materials and also the decorative techniques. Uh, if he was not, of course, aided by a catalog prepared by the collector himself. So in addition to the three helmets uh, listed at the very top of the inventory, uh, he had two armors, not indicated whether male or not, but one was uh, well kept in its special case. Then there were pairs of pauldrons and gauntlets and various belts. The inventory listed numerous bows and arrows, 
kept in embroidered velvet uh, quivers. Uh, a few of them were indicated as from Egypt, or carefully wrapped in handkerchiefs, as well as axes, spikes, maces, a bejeweled dagger, and many knives with ornate handles and gold or silver decorated sheets. In addition to various harness pieces, there were altogether 14 saddles and a matching 14 felt saddle clothes, mostly of red and lilac woolens or Russian style fine leather decorated with gilt and silver pieces and one was indicated an, as Arab. Why would a Tmariot an, or an imperial accountant would have 14 saddles and uh, saddle coats? Uh, and furthermore, he had only three horses. Why would he amass such a collection if it was not simply for the sake of collecting. There were also decorative pieces for embellishing horses during parades. And it was only the viziers or uh, of very high-ranking officers who had the right to uh, parade and uh, show uh, their uh, riches. In contrast to the bejeweled arms, armory, and horse trappings, his treasury of gold and gems was limited to a brush, some buttons, clasps, pins, and buckles, uh, mostly, you know, uh, in, it's indicated that these were broken and uh, missing some uh, pieces. Uh, there was one indicated as Magyar fibulase, possibly an ancient Roman brush or a pin for uh, fastening garments. There were also rings and two necklaces and some fragments of various other broken jewelry, indicating that these were perhaps all antiques. What is sensational are the coins that he collected and some of these, those were collector's items. The five gold pieces minted by the last Harzem Sultan, Celaleddin Ekber, for example, testifies to his antiquarian impulse. Celaleddin Ekber died in 1231. His real treasury, however, was the manuscripts and a collection was his manuscripts and a collection of official documents carefully recorded by the scribe as written in Talik, Nesih, Divani and Sulus script in addition to numerous official registers, law codes and journals. His interest in Ottoman luxury arts is best exemplified by a role of calligraphy identified by the hand of Ahmed Karahisari, who died in 1565, uh, was the eminent calligrapher of the 16th century. Uh, I mean, uh, was very similar in rank and status to Mimar Sinan, or uh, if not Mimar Sinan, uh, Nakkash Osman. Uh, whose work decorated the, the sultan's mosques and palaces in Istanbul. Uh, he had uh, produced a number of monumental uh, Qurans, uh, which uh, still survive, <coughs> luckily. And uh, in addition to such specified uh, items, uh, most curiously, Ali Celebi possessed some papers of uh, Mehmet II. Yeah. There's also the possibility that these papers identified as Shah Sultan Mehmet Hattı ile bazı evrak. There is this possibility that they've been uh, uh, from the hands of Mehmet III. But you know, uh, if he uh, is uh, hunting. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
impulse, uh, there's quite a possibility that uh, he had access to uh, find uh, some uh, written some papers of Mehmed II, and this might also suggest a connection uh, to the royal house. The 120 plus manuscripts in Turkish, Persian, and uh, Arabic listed in the inventory include a special collection of gazettes okay, uh, in more than 20 volumes and Persian classics, almost all the Persian classics that the Ottomans enjoyed reading at the time, such as Firdevsi, Hafiz, uh, Fuzuli, and many others. Naturally, Qurans and uh, other religious books were many, but manuscripts in history, astronomy, medicine, um, and the ones that I have also already mentioned, show the real range of his the real range and depth of his interest. A history of the Jews and Christian hagiographies were listed next to Homeroic poems in Persian. There were dictionaries of Arabic and Persian, but no books in European languages. Some of the book bindings specified as Ajem must have been sumptuously uh, lacquered or uh, gilded ones. This was truly a treasury. Fekete noted that a library of this scope was probably rivaled by one or two other sophisticated men in the Hungarian lands of his times, and this applies to other parts of uh, Europe uh, as well. Uh, the uh, connoisseur <coughs> of uh, fine art objects uh, who purchased books as part of his collection was expected to be as little expert personally in their contents as he was in painting technique or gem cutting, but numerous volumes of uh, junk gazeliat or manzum in Turkish suggest an ardent reader here. Nevertheless, it is true that ostentatious expenditure on fine books guaranteed that the purchase would be established for posterity as a person of virtue, honor, and nobility, regardless of his social origins or the sources of his wealth. The ways in which Ali obtained these antiquities and artwork, whether by purchase, theft, inheritance, or as gift, remains unknown. But the question I want to ask at this point is, what is missing in his inventory when compared, say, to the contemporary princely inventories of Western Europe? One would immediately list uh, benches, stools, chairs, tables and sideboards, cabinets, beds and canopies, desks and bookcases, all those portable furniture which gave comfort and convenience to the domestic interiors of knights and monks, merchants and bankers. Uh, in Florence, in Rome, uh, in Paris, Brussels, uh, along with the new urban prosperity from the second half of the 15th century onwards, particularly marked in Italy, it has been argued, an increased number of palaces and villas were uh, constructed by the middle classes, made up of artisans, bankers, and merchants, subsequently creating a greater demand for extravagant furniture and domestic decorative art, basically paintings and sculptures, both for the established aristocratic 
patrons and the newly uh, wealthy. There are no precise parallels to all this in the Ottoman world. But certainly it would be far-fetched to assume that the Ottomans being more interested in taking care of their outlooks with textiles and accessories rather than their homes. An urban, urban Ottoman was expected to manifest a sober approach to worldly possessions, but this had to be balanced against the um, public and political expectation for great men to actually display uh, grandness through luxury. As a result, Ottoman moralists came to emphasize a cautious approach to life, prudence in climbing the social ladder, guarding against excessive ambition, a loving for sudden changes in fortune and not engaging in any excessive displays of wealth or ambition that might trigger envy or uh, by violating class lines might endanger the existing class structure. While Ottoman observers complained about an excess of luxury imports and also kept gossiping about those viziers whom they regarded as poorly or uh, flamboyantly uh, dressed and who thereby attracted properly slanderous nicknames. At the same time, they absolutely stressed the royal dynastic need for luxury. A distinction had to be made between private spending and public forms of expenditure associated with the virtue of magnificence. What should we make of the difference between the somber conclusions driving from studies of uh, moralist uh, texts and the minimalist legalist inventories uh, that we uh, struggle to interpret? and the often more optimistic views of cross-cultural exchange that emerge from studies of material artifacts themselves. Uh, this is a major task for future research. Thank you once again for coming and uh, for your patience.